Welcome back, everybody. Um, <coughs> next up, we have Ivan Poslu. He is the lead developer of uh, Real. He's uh, from Pretoria, and he's, uh, he goes to many uh, Python conferences, and he's here today with us. W welcome. Good afternoon. Um, yeah, so I work on this uh, project called Real. I've talked a couple of times about it here. This is, you know, one of the things that we do with Real is also we experiment with a lot of uh, development infrastructural stuff and how do you do development and we make mistakes and fix them, uh, stuff like that. So uh, what I'm presenting today is just uh, some of this stuff. It's not rocket science, it's but it's fairly technical. Uh, stuff that we felt just worked really well for our tests. I, I talked about this last year a little bit because I gave some background as to fixtures and uh, how they relate to other things. I'm not going to repeat that here. Yeah, that's the, the link on there for the talk of last year if you'd like to see that. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, what our fixtures are and what makes them different from something like PyTest fixtures is that uh, they're, they're actually classes who that, that give you a collection of test objects that together belong together and that you want to use in a particular test. And I want to show you a little bit about what they are, a little bit more detail, and then how, how we use them to solve interesting technical problems while testing. So <coughs> the, the, the real basics of just the fixture is uh, up there on the screen. The, the idea is you just inherit from fixture and you write for each object that you want, you write a method uh, prefixed with new. Uh, I inside of that thing, it's pretty much like a PyTest fixture. It just needs to create a thing. It can also yield it. And uh, we usually use keyword args that supply the defaults. If you wanted just a person and didn't want to say what that person looked like, you just could just call the function. But look at the bottom half of that. I hope you can see it. I try to move things up for this room. So the idea is that, first of all, you create a fixture and use it inside of a with statement. And inside there, you can talk about, you can refer to fixture.person, for example. It will automatically call that new function without arguments and give you the default person back. It's also the, the one trick is the second time you call it, it will still give you the same instance back. So you don't have to worry. You uh, sort of conceptually can just think of there being a person on this fixture, right? You can also call the new method yourself if you want something non-standard, something that isn't default, in which case the, the trickery uh, won't be in play. So one of the big reasons why we do this is when you have more than one object that relate to one another, often the dependencies between them can be very intricate and you don't want to see that in your tests. Um, if, if you listen to, what was his name, Carlo's talk earlier, um, or oh no, Antonio, uh, we also really try to make the tests very readable. They should sort of explain a little bit about your problem domain. So all this technical stuff that's often in uh, and the setup stuff that need to happen, we try to get that out of them. And in this case, if you see there on the screen, uh, so if you have a person and a bank account, you typically the bank account owner would be the person. Uh, and uh, when you have a more I intricate problem domain, you tend to have a couple of clusters of objects that belong together and have these dependencies but in your fixture uh, in your test itself you can just use the objects and you don't have to know about these difficult dependencies between them we also actually run setup and tear down we have uh, a decorator for to mark functions and you can have more uh, methods more than one uh, and for tear down that will run at the beginning of that with block and the tear down at the end all of this stuff actually existed last year this time. So what happened since then is we have integrated it with PyTest. And that's what I want to show you now. So we have this decorator called with fixtures. So if you decorate a function with that and you just put the class that you want to use as a fixture, we will make sure that that thing gets instantiated and gets passed into your test function. 
you can use more than one. And how it works is basically that uh, the names of your arguments don't have any significance. You, the order does. So it will just send the instance of the first one into the first argument. You can call it what you want and so on. You can actually also mix this with normal PyTest fixtures because uh, uh, just as long as you add them at the end. So you can have uh, a whole mixture of things if you'd like. So <coughs> fixtures are almost like little modules, but they exist only temporarily for the duration of a test or, or whatever. Which means that very often you want one fixture de to depend on another fixture because one fixture should have the responsibility for certain things that belong together. Uh, we can do that as well and this is how it works. I there's another decorator. It takes uh, keyword arguments and what it does is whatever class you uh, specify there would be instantiated and it would be assigned to an attribute on the instance of your fixture, the using fixture, if I can put it that way, w using the name that you've got there. So you can see in this example, uh, it says there's self.parties.person to be able to get to the, to the other fixture. And of course, one of the things that are very important is that different fixtures could ca have different scope. Pretty much like PyTest, most things default, or no, all things default to have a function scope. We, the only other scope we currently have is session scope, meaning it'll only run the setup once. Of course, the objects will only be created once you actually access one of them, and the teardown of all of this will happen only at the end of all your test runs, obviously for expensive things. So what motivated us to, to do this and not use the standard PyTest things besides the fact that we want collections of objects as fixtures is also we reuse things a lot <coughs> and we ha struggled with the funny naming things that PyTest often does. We prefer to just be able to import something in a module just like you normally would. Also we wanted a fixture as a collection of things, so we wanted each fixture to have responsibility for a certain bit of the problem domain. And we needed these things to have dependencies on others because that's how you, you usually structure code. But uh, we also don't want the tests to know what the dependencies of that fixture is that they are using. We don't want to worry about any of that stuff. And, and uh, something that we also try to achieve is to not reuse things by means of inheritance. So, and, and this we're now able to do everywhere. So I want to show you a little bit about how we use this in our system. You could do the same with other things as well. What we do, one of the basic things that takes a lot of time is when we start up, we need to create a database. We need to create tables in that database, in, in, in our case, and we need to connect to it. And that's something you only want to do once, because it takes a lot of time. To be able to do that, you also sort of need the system configuration, because the configuration is what would specify which database to connect to and all kinds of things. So. These are really things that should always be there, which means we've got the session scoped fixture that has the configuration on it and something that we call the system control. It's what we control the database and the ORM and all kinds of things with uh, together. And basically just what it does is it sets up, it creates all of these things. If you use it though, you do have a problem because, as in this example, if you'd, for example, change the configuration, uh, of course the next test will now have side effects from this. So you can't really have this global thing that you keep using for the whole session. To solve that, what we do is we sort of have a shadow fixture, if you like, called the real sys uh, system fixture, which is function scoped and it just copies the configuration from the other one. So you can change it to your heart's content and it'll be thrown away after each test, right? We can't do the same with a database. So to deal with a database, we have a different tactic. We do everything via SQL Alchemy. So we have a SQL Alchemy fixture as well. And what that does is before each test starts to run, it starts a transaction. 
at the end of the test, it, it just rolls it all back. I'll show you what else it can do in a moment. But it means you can write simple tests like these. You don't need to know about transactions, about the database, about the schema, about anything. You can just simply talk SQL Alchemy. Do, do you guys know SQL Alchemy? I don't know. Okay, for those who don't know it, so it's an ORM sort of tool, similar to Django ORM, very similar. So here we, we just create one of those persistible classes and query for it again. So it's now in the database. But it will get rolled back at the end, so we don't uh, have tests that, that tread on each other's toes. What we can also do, which I think is quite neat, and sometimes you have some of these test objects that you only need for a specific test and it needs its own tables in the database so you don't really want to create them as part of your main schema right we have got this context manager though that allows you to create your class inside the test and just tell sql alchemy that you're going to use it now and it'll create the tables just right there on the spot and it'll do the necessary wiring inside of SQL Alchemy to make sure you can use them as per normal and of course it all will also get rolled back. Now this is a problem that, that I find interesting. O almost everywhere where I see where people test things via Selenium they have a setup kind of like this. You have one process in which your tests run, another one of course the web browser itself is a separate process as well and then another process which is the web server also besides the fact that you have two processes or sometimes two threads uh, these things tend to have their own connections to the database as well which means they have their own transactions that they deal with and this creates a lot of complexity here's a little diagram to just say uh, show one scenario so if I have these two transactions, what typically happens is your test process, you want to do some setup and create objects in the database, right? Then you have to commit them so that when you talk to the web browser and it in turn talks to the web server, then the web server should be able to see those objects in its transaction. So you have to do the commit before you can get here. And also the web server, of course, also has to commit so that you can, at the end of the test process, check these things again. So there's a lot of knowledge that you have to have about transaction handling, which we feel is totally redundant. I, I don't want to see that in a test. The other problem, I don't know if you've experienced it, um, is if you talk to a web browser, the web browser talks to the web server and something breaks server side you don't know about that immediately in your test because the web framework is going to do something to deal with that exception and it's going to send the response back to the web browser. If you're lucky, an error response, and you can check for that easily. If you're unlucky, the page just isn't going to look quite the way you wanted it to look. And if you don't actually specifically go and check for stuff on that page, you'll never know that something went wrong. So that's just a little bit cumbersome. So what we do is instead of doing that we have one process and one thread of control in that process that runs the test code as soon as we invoke selenium we let the web server code run and it serves all the requests that comes from the web browser one after another until they're all done and it returns to pytest which means that there's one thread of control if something breaks server side your test breaks right there and you see the stack trace of the server side so that's a nice to have. Also, there's only one database connection, so there's only one database transaction. So we can do this stuff of rolling back the transaction even if we talk via a web server. This is how we wrap it in the fixtures. Basically, just like we had with the database stuff, we have a web server fixture which does the slow stuff like starting up a web server at the beginning. Uh, starting up uh, web browsers for Selenium, stuff like that. And then we have a, a shadowing one, the web fixture, which you would actually use in your tests. So for, for the heavy stuff, it will punch through, obviously, to, to the session scoped one. But it can do other neat things. For example, I don't know if you've tried on some web apps 
uh, often you need to log in first. Uh, the slow way, if you want lots of slow tests, would be to go and click on all kinds of pages to log in, right? But we can just log in by setting the right cookies or whatever it is on the web browser and doing the right stuff server-side in the database. To do this, the web fixture actually has to know about something else that we've got called the party account fixture because it needs like the to know about your account that with which you log into the system and stuff like that. Um, here's a little example. We've got this thing these things called widgets, and this is one of them, that allows you to upload a bunch of files. And how this thing works is, if you choose a particular file, it would upload it in Ajax, or using Ajax, which leaves you free to also choose more files, more files, that, that very basic thing. So, to test the basics of this, here's the test. I'll give you some time to just read through it, because I know there's, there's a bit of text there. So we use two fixtures. If you look at the top there, the bold bits, we use the web fixture, but then we also use a fixture that we made specifically for this little widget that we know has a bunch of stuff on there that we typically use when we test this widget. I'll talk about that on the next slide. Uh, let's get the, the technical stuff out of the way. So usually what you must do at the beginning of such a test is just decide or tell the web server which WSG app it should actually run because each test will have its own typically. And also then we've got something strange which I don't want to talk about now. It's called a browser. It's just our interface to Selenium. So I if you switch more to the actual things we want to test, this test is rather simple actually if you read it because you say, well, I want to check that this file isn't uploaded. Then you click on all the things you need to on this widget and afterwards you want to check that the file is uploaded. Uh, I think that's sort of fairly simple to see what the intent of this thing is. I might be wrong, tell me afterwards. But you can see the tricks that we pulled here. For example, we extract methods onto these fixtures. So it's not only actually the objects that we use that are on these fixtures, but also useful methods that we reuse in other tests. There are things like the temporary files that we have to create in the fixture that we want to use. But this test doesn't need to know anything about that. It just knows there are a bunch of files and it can ask whether a file has been uploaded. And it actually works because, well, that, that method file was uploaded, goes and checks in the database to see whether it arrived there. So it needs to deal with all this transaction issues and so on. But look, we do stuff in the database at the top. Then we do web stuff. We click on the web browser, we talk to Selenium, then we check again and there's nothing happening here relating to transactions, nothing that you need to care about. And yeah, we find that very nice. Here's another example of something totally different that we do with it. The same thing, we, as I said, these uploads happen via Ajax. So while it's actually busy uploading, it displays a cancel button like this and a progress bar. How do you test that from Python? So what we do, this is just a snippet of the test that tests that. We can tell the web server to go and run in a background thread for a while so that it actually does have its own thread of control. It's all still on the same transaction. But what we've done in this particular test is we have stubbed the application itself so that when you try to upload the file, it blocks forever. So we can simulate that it's a long file that uploads. So while that web server is then blocked, we can check things like, oh, is the progress bar displayed? Can we click on the cancel button? Stuff like that. Right, one thing that I'm not going to say a whole lot about, because I, I know some, th there are it's like Emacs and VI, this story. <coughs> some people do it, some people just don't. But there, there's lots of stuff that you want to be able to access from different places in a program, like who's currently logged in, what's the configuration of the system. Um, what locale I must use to decide to display this weird error message in, or 
Th there's a whole bunch of stuff that you typically want to be able to access and you don't always want to send these things along as parameters to the methods or the objects uh, where they need to be used. So what we have is this sort of global object called the execution context and what it does is <coughs> you can grab it out of thin air anywhere you are by using that class method to say get context and uh, this example shows you that how you can actually then get to the configuration of the system. So the reason why people don't like this is if you have a global like this, it makes tests very difficult because you need the thing to be available, you need to set it up, stuff like that. I'm not going to go into the implementation of this, but I want to show you how it's used. In, in fact, I have already. Because our context is integrated with SQL Alchemy. SQL Alchemy, when you use those class methods like session.add, must already go and figure out what's the current transaction. You don't know about that here. The context is dealt with by the fixtures behind the scenes for you. You can grab it out of thin air in this test too if you'd like. You can grab it out of thin air in the server side code if you'd like. But it's, it's really actually not difficult. This is just sort of a quick overview of, of all of those basic fixtures. I'm not going to walk you through it. I just wanted it on the slide somewhere that we've gone through. And you'll see there's one that I didn't talk about. But chat to me if you're interested. There are a bunch of stuff that we haven't figured out how to do nicely yet. So please, if there are ideas and hands that want to help. One thing we struggle with, especially with funny tests, like the one I showed you where we put the web server in the background block and click on cancel. Those things are dependent on how browsers deal with their JavaScript engines and things. So they only work on very particular versions of very particular browsers. And like in our CI environment, we have to make sure that we download a very particular version of Chrome to be able to do this. Uh, we, which is not entirely uh, nice. We also test things with and without JavaScript in places. And a lot of the Selenium stuff doesn't work if JavaScript is really, really switched off. So how do you simulate this? Currently, we just do not serve the JavaScript files. But that doesn't always quite do what you want to do. Um, also, the normal, y you must know this, if a browser pops up a GUI button like the upload dialog or whatever, that's always still a tricky thing. We're, we're waiting for the new stuff that will come out uh, in the Firefox driver, I think, might, might do that in future. And then we have no nice way to test CSS things. We do quite a bit because we wrap CSS in so, uh, with Python, so you don't have to deal with the CSS. How do we test that? You can do it with Selenium, but it's so super cumbersome that we haven't really done that. Uh, we just check that the right classes are in the right places and stuff like that. But then what happens is Bootstrap decides to move from alpha version 3 to alpha version 4, and everything works, but back at the launch, it actually doesn't work anymore. So we, ha we don't have a nice way to deal with that. That's roughly it. Um, this is simple stuff, but it's nice. Uh, I just want to put a disclaimer. We haven't released this stuff yet. We're still working. We sit in the funny scenario where we wanted to be on Bootstrap, and we wanted to be on Bootstrap 4. <laughs> and is it one and a half years ago they started <laughs> with Bootstrap 4? And we thought, great, it's an alpha one. We can start using this stuff. And then they kept changing it and changing it. and cha So we're basically waiting for them to release and... and in the meantime, working on our development infrastructure and documentation and stuff. So if you're really interested in this stuff, please come and talk to me. It uh, would be nice if someone wants to play with it as well. And those are the details. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've got uh, time for questions. Does anyone have... Um, here we go. Uh, just a quick question on w disabling JavaScript. Um, why not just use of one of the kind of lower level um, browsers that does not have JavaScript? Because one of the reasons you go for Selenium is that you actually get the f f JavaScript. Yes. Um, can't you just do requests and check your we HTML? We do that with some things. Uh, what's the? Is it web test? We use web test. Yeah. 
So the browser thing I showed you there, we have two browser implementations with the same interface, so we can have the same kind of interface talking to Selenium as we do to web test. But sometimes you want more than that. Because sometimes you want to see in a real browser that different CSS <coughs> stuff happen depending on whether there's CSS or whether there's JavaScript or not. So, so yes, we have that as well. Do we have uh, more questions? Here we go. Do the the um, session fixture I think you called it that you load initially is that you? Basically, persist your base database across test runs, or that it loads when you start your test run. What we, uh, before we start the test runs, what it will do is it will create a database schema. So it creates an empty database with all the right tables and things in it, and then, so that stays there. But in between the tests, we just roll back. So you still build a schema, but between every test run? Because that's what's slowing no us no down. No, 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 the schema happens only once. So the schema stays there. Okay. But the actual data that goes in gets rolled back. Uh, also, uh, um, we, we can switch. We can use in-memory databases as well. And so uh, here we go. Um, building on the, the previous, um, one of the issues we experienced quite a bit is that if I understand correctly, if you built the schema initially and you do, you need to you change your model and you need you also need to do a migration on your test schema that you initially built. Um, how do you deal with that? Or um? we do deal with migration, but it's not an issue in testing because what we do in the test runs is the schema that you build would be for the current version of the code. So, so the database doesn't persist forever. It just persists for this test run. So if you run the tests at the beginning, it gets created, it stays there, and when all your tests are through it, you nuke it again. Do we have more questions? Uh, we do have some time still, so if you have more. I have more. Question. Um, so, since this is open source, I saw you chose the uh, federal GPL license there. Is that correct? Yes. Um, just uh, the pitfalls of running uh, open source software. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, you, how many contributors are there, and how do you deal with it? Um, maybe tips for people starting uh, projects. Um, that's a funny question. You know, why do people do it? I don't think we start open source projects because we want to become millionaires. Uh, a f a funny thing, I, I just did a talk in PyCon Nigeria a month or two ago uh, about that topic. <laughs> so why should you do open source in Africa? It's because you're interested in stuff. Or this is why we're doing it. You know, we had this idea and the question is, can you actually do it? Is it idealistic? Is it possible? And uh, currently where we are, you know, we we can do. S you can actually use it in production. It's stable and so on. But you probably wouldn't be able to do all the neat user interface stuff that you can do with a framework that doesn't try and do this high-level stuff for you. So we're not really there yet. But in doing that, you learn stuff. You you learn a lot of stuff. I I don't know where I would have been if I didn't have the freedom to do this, to make the mistakes, to have to go and do stuff over again, and to be faced with the brunt of the entire project in front of you. So I I, f I find that valuable. Maybe we make it one day. Maybe we don't. But I think along the way there's lots of valuable stuff that actually come out, and that's why I've been doing a couple of talks on testing because we've done a bunch of things with infrastructure that I think is useful and that other projects could maybe also use. And and just to come back to my talk about uh, uh, in in PyCon Nigeria, I think it's really really important for Africa, for us in Africa to actually run our own open source project. You know, we, we can't stay being the consumers of open source projects elsewhere, even though we get all the stuff for free. That's not really what it's about. If we want to have experts here, 
who understand stuff, the nitty gritty of all kinds of stuff, then we have to build those projects. Maybe participate in some, but also be the the driving forces behind some others. And and I think that's something that we we should push. In your testing strategy, how, how much effort do you use this framework for? I mean, this is sort of a end-to-end -end test scenarios. How, how heavily do you use it for that? Do you unit tests as well? How we how have a whole, th that's an entire talk, actually. <laughs> um, and, and the talk this morning of Antonio touched upon some of those issues. But I, I think actually testing is one of the most difficult things, partly because we of often don't have the infrastructure, but also just to decide what to write the test for. So what we do is, if you read the XP material, they say in there that, well, okay, a test really should be an executable statement of your requirements. And that's what we try to do. You know, uh, the system is already fairly big. We can't remember everything. So for me, that's sort of a shorthand for little bits of how we understand that part of the problem. And that is what we want to write tests for, and that's our thrust. I don't even like to use the word unit tests, but this is like through and through. Some th it depends on what you test. If you want to test a widget like this, you need Selenium. You need to test uh, an ajax -y aspect of it. You need it in a browser. Maybe it's dependent on something in the database as well. If you Whatever selection of those things that you actually need should be there if you want to test a particular requirement and focus on that. Does that For for this particular project, now this is this. In your, your work. In oh no, of course I do all kinds of other things. Um, <laughs> uh, most of them not in the Java world. So I I do get exposed. Uh, not in the Python world, sorry. But a, a lot of them in the Java world. I'm also very involved in small talk things. So, but that's for totally unrelated to this, really. Do we have uh, more questions? There we go. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, is this another testing framework? Was I do you mention PyTest and uh, those are with fixtures, is it part of PyTest or something? No, we use PyTest. We didn't use to we used to be on nose, but this is we use PyTest now and this is sort of a an add on. We specifically wrote it to be able to run our tests on PyTest, but to be able to do our test setup the way we wanted to do it. So this is sort of a little add-on to, to PyTest. <coughs> Any, f oh, here we go. Um, I like the, the setup and the teardown uh, examples you showed. Um, I'm not sure if you've had any experience with this, but is that something that can be extended to file system testing? Um, writing something to file test if the data is written and s reset the file system to where it was? You, you can. You, you could do anything in there that you really want. Uh, we just use normally temporary, uh, temporary files as well uh, as objects on the fixtures, so we don't use it for that, but you could. Any further questions, anyone? Going once. All right, thank you very much, Ivan. Thanks so thank much. Thank you.